recording? No. Right now, no. There was one person here before, but he left. Good morning, my dear friends. Today is a very special day. Why is it such a special day? Because for three reasons. Reason number one, it's a special day, is because today is Lag Baumer. Lag Baumer is the 33rd day of the Omer. Good morning, Malka. The 33rd day of the Omer. And the 33rd day of the Omer is considered by Jewish people as a very, very, very special Jewish holiday. It's the day that the students of Rabbi Akiva stopped dying after a plague that wiped out 24,000 of his students. It's the day of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yard site, his day of passing, and he asked before he died that his day of passing should be a day of celebration. Till this day in the northern city of Miron, where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried, hundreds of thousands of Jews come to celebrate his Hilula, the day of his celebration, the day of his passing. And it's a day of special, special, um, merit. it's a meritorious day because it's a day that we could rely on Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai for all good things, all goods. So that's the first reason it's special. The second reason it's special is because in 1984, the Rabbi, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, Rabbi, he instituted a, a um, cycle of study of Rambam, Maimonides. Every day we study a little bit of Maimonides. It's the only work that covers Kol HaTayra Kulu, the entire Torah. And every day we study a little bit of it. And at the end of the year, we complete the entire Maimonides. We do this every single year. Today is the day that we completed, actually last night, we completed the entire study of the book of Maimonides. We made a celebration and a seum. A day like today where the Rambam Maimonides and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai come together in one day won't happen for another 300 years, at least. So it's a very special day where the days of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Maimonides, the Rambam, were both prominent, special figures in Jewish history and in Jewish culture. It's a very, it's a day of incredible, incredible spiritual power. It's also Thursday today, which is the day that we studied Tanya. And we completed the study of three chapters already. And today we're going to talk about the fourth chapter. But let me give you a little bit of background. My dear friends, the Alter Rebbe set out to, the Alter Rebbe, Rishnir Zaman al Adi, the Balatanya, sets out in this book to give us a picture, to give us a sort of guide, guideline, a systematic and very specific system of how to, a Jew should live with God, experience his spirituality, and ultimately, the verse from Moses, when the day of his passing, where he tells the Jewish people that serving God and being a Jew and following Torah and mitzvot is something that is not unattainable, it's not far away, it's something that is close, Kikardiv, it's exceedingly close. And this is really the reason why, this is really the reason why the Alter Rebbe wrote this entire book, to explain how it is exceedingly close, how it is that we are going to be able to fulfill <clears throat> this closeness with God. So the Alter Rebbe begins by telling us that it's a, it's a book of 53 chapters. And really, it's an, inform, it's an instructional book. What does it mean instructional? Some books that you pick up are instructional, and some books are informational, right? An informational book will give you information, right? It will tell you about things. It will tell you about history. It will tell you about whatever it is. That's informational. Instructional means that the book is telling you how to live your life, right? Self-help books are instructional. The Tanya is an instructional book. However, the Alter Rebbe dedicates the first eight chapters of Tanya in order to give us a new vocabulary. He explains to us new concepts that we wouldn't know before we open the Tanya. And with this 
when we get these eight chapters down pat, we have the informational part of Tanya covered, then the Rebbe moves us into the instructional part of Tanya. It's kind of like a cookbook. A cookbook, you have ingredients, that's the informational part of the cookbook. And then you have the instructions of how to use the, how to use the ingredients. That's, inf that's instructional, right? So you take the ingredients, you put them together. First you put in one thing, then you put in the other thing. And out will come your favorite recipe. So the al Tareb is doing the same kind of thing here in this book. He tells us first that we need to understand what it is, the purpose of life. How to figure out what it is that we're, that we're supposed to do in life. Why did God create us with such complex complex um, physiology and, and psycho, psychology and just our complex lives that we live? Why did God make it in this way? So in chapter one, he tells us that the soul comes down into the world. And God tells the soul that he should be a tzaddik. And he shouldn't be a rasha. So right away, we have two terminologies. We have a tzaddik and we have a rasha. What's a tzaddik and what's a rasha? I don't know. And then Al Rebbe tells us that as you go through the Talmudic understanding, the, ta the Talmud, you find that there's another type of personality, and that's a Bainin. So we have three types of personalities. We have a Tzaddik, a Rasha, and a Bainin. What are they? So Al Rebbe in chapter one tries to figure it out. And basically, what he gets to at the end of the day is that a Tzaddik is somebody who is completely in line with God's will. He's always doing what God wants. And a Russia is somebody who's never in line with God's will. He's never doing what God wants. That explains what a tzaddik and a Russia is. But a bainani is something that's a little bit more complicated, a little more complex to understand. So the Alter Rebbe says, in order to understand what is a bainani, we first need to understand something from Kabbalah. And that is that every single Jew, every single person has two souls. We're not made up of one soul. We're made up of two souls. And he goes on for the rest of chapter one to explain to us what is this one soul. The first soul. Why is it called the first soul? It's called the first soul because it's the soul that a person has. First, when he comes into this world, when a child is born, right away he gets the first soul. Only later does he acquire fully the second soul. So what is the first soul? The first soul is the natural soul. It's the soul that wants to survive. It's the survival mechanism. It's the soul that's worried about self-preservation. It's the soul that wants to do good in the world. And it also is the soul that from the negative character traits of the human being come from. It's the soul that encompasses the human experience. It's the human soul or the negative, or, or some, the Alter Rebbe calls it later on, the animal soul animalistic in nature it just wants to survive it wants to just do what it whatever it takes to stay in my body to do whatever it needs whatever i need to do to remain focused in the life that i'm living and the negative character traits come from it and the positive character traits come from it it's good and bad in other words it's not a bad soul it's just a survival soul then the altar Rebbe tells us in chapter two that there is another soul. And this soul is not selfish at all. The opposite. It's selfless. This soul wants transcendence. It wants to connect to the oneness, to God. That's the only thing it wants to do. And it's uniquely Jewish. It's a uniquely Jewish soul. Every person has these two souls. The godly soul and the animal soul. Okay. So now that we understand that every person has two souls. So that takes care of a lot of our issues already at the get-go. Because we know now that when we have, when we have um, two feelings within us at the same time, one of them wants to indulge in the physical, materialistic experiences of life. And then there's another part of me that, that's telling me that I want to connect to God, that I want transcendence, that I, want, I don't want all of this materialism. And you start to think that you're maybe there's something wrong with you. So the Alter Rebbe tells you right away that there's nothing wrong with you. Every person has two 
elements of his personality. And not only are they two inclinations, but they are two operating systems. Both of them have within them the full gamut of the experience of life. What is the whole gamut of the experience of life? So the Rebbe continues in chapter three. And the Rebbe tells us in chapter three, and he starts off with the godly soul. And he tells us that the godly soul is made up of 10 building blocks. These 10 building blocks are the intellect and the emotion. And he went through, last week we went through the entire, the whole thing. The 10, each one is a representation of a different personality trait. But the main idea that Dr. Rebbe wanted to convey to us is that emotions in the godly soul, they are a product of the mind. When a person contemplates godliness, the greatness of God, in him will be born of love for God or a fear of God, or a, an awe of God. It needs to start in the mind, and then it's processed into the heart. He called it parents and children. The parents are the intellect. The children are the emotions. The emotions are a byproduct of the intellect. One of the key elements is das. The third one of the intellectual faculties is das, and that is the intellect of the mind, the intellect. That is when the mind focuses, when it allows itself to really take an idea, to really meditate on it, to think about it so that from it will be born a beautiful emotion. That was but here's the secret. As we go into chapter four today, chapter four is going to tell us that all of what we said last week all the personalities, the functions of the human being within his soul, the intellect, the emotion, the type of personalities that each one is made up of. Some people are more chesed people. They're more kind, they're more loving, they're more giving, they're more uh, sensitive, relaxed, laid back, that's chesed. Gevura are people that are more assertive, they're more disciplined. They have, bound, they have boundaries. They're, they're more uptight, right? All of these have different flavors to them. But there are different types of personalities. And then there is Das. Das is charisma. Tiferes. People that are more charismatic. They have a good balance of both, right? The character trait that God created you with. The personality that you come to the world with is who you are. That's chapter three. Chapter three in three words is who you are, that's who you are. Chapter four tells us that this, this character traits that you have, the chesed, kavura, tiferes, netzach, leid, malchus, all the 10 building blocks, it's who you are. That's chapter three, but chapter four tells us that all of this can be expressed <clears throat> in the outside world. And once you express it to yourself in the outside world, that's already who, what you do. There's who you are and there's what you do. So in chapter four, Dr. Rebbe discusses what you do. And he calls it, just like he called this, the parents and the children, the metaphor for what you do is clothing, the clothing of the soul, right? Chapter three was about the soul, the makeup of the soul, the anatomy of the soul, the personality of the soul who you are, chapter four is what you do, how you express what you are to others and to yourself. And the way you do it is in three ways. There are three garments of the soul. There's thought, speech, and action. If you're sitting around people and you wanna express yourself in thought, speech, and action, you can do it in any of those ways, right? Obviously, thought is not going to express yourself to other people. Thought is the way you express yourself to yourself. Sometimes there's a very deep level within you. Sometimes it's subconscious. And in order to get it out, in order to explain something that's happening within you to yourself, you use machshav, you use thought. In order to give it over to somebody else, you'll use either speech or action. This is all called 
clothing. Why is it called clothing? For two reasons. Reason number one is because clothing, clothing makes a person, right? Clothing make a man. When a person comes in, he's wearing a tuxedo, he's wearing a very fine suit. People perceive him as somebody who's very well to do. If somebody's walking along with rags or tags, walking around with holes in his pants, people perceive him as somebody who needs help. Your clothing give off the impression of who you are to others. So thought, speech, and action, most of it, is the way that you express yourself to others and to yourself. So that's why it's called clothing. But the other reason why it's called clothing is because clothing could be taken off and put on at will. I could decide that I want to wear my shirt. And if I want, right now, I could take off my shirt. Wouldn't be a good idea. But I could. I could take off my clothes and put them on whenever I want. So the same thing is with thought, speech, and action. A person has such control. A person has perfect control, if he wants to, over what he thinks about, over what he speaks, what he says, and what he does. If I'm saying something not nice about somebody else, and all of a sudden that person comes into the room, what's my natural instinct going to do? I'm going to stop talking about it right away. How do I have such power that I could stop my sentence, mid-sentence, I could stop talking? Because speech is clothing. Action is clothing, right? If I'm going into a, house, into a, into a store, and I'm looking around to see if anybody's looking so that I can take something, put it in my pocket. And all of a sudden, as I'm about to put it in my pocket, I see somebody turns into the aisle and he's looking at me. Right away, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm not going to do it when somebody's looking at me. Why? Because I have the power of impulse control. Impulse control means that when I'm doing something, when I'm speaking something, and even when I'm thinking something, I can stop. That's clothing. Clothing means I could take it off at will and I could put it on at will. So this is what clothing is. Thought, speech, action. This is the way that the soul expresses itself in thought and speech and in action. So now we know what the soul is made up of, the anatomy of the soul, what our personality is. And then we know the way that the soul expresses itself is in thought, speech, and action. So why is the author ever telling us this? What do you think, Dr. Rebbe, this is all informational. But Dr. Rebbe wants to get to something. And I'm going to spoil it for you. I'm going to tell you what Dr. Rebbe is going to say. Dr. Rebbe is not going to say this until later on. In chapters 12, really chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, Dr. Rebbe is going to tell us that who you are, you don't really have control over. God creates you in a certain way. That's who you are, that's your personality. But what you do is wholly up to you. You have full control over what you do, what you think, what you speak, and what you do that's in your control 100%. Now, you might ask, and some people do ask this question, hey, wait, Rabbi, I get action, I could stop right away. I'm in full control over my actions. I get speech. I, I have full control over what I, say, what I say and what I don't say. But Rabbi. I didn't understand that. Sorry, that was. But Rabbi, are you telling me that I have full control over my thoughts? It's impossible. Now I'm going to go to the mic and I'd like to ask your opinions. Do you think that a person has full control over his thoughts? Yes or no? Or if you have a more elaborate answer, I'd love to hear that as well. Does a person have control over his thoughts? Can I speak? Yeah. Hi. Um, I think that to a degree we do. 
I mean, whatever comes to our mind, we have no control over what comes in. I mean, we, we do have control, but we don't always have control. I'm driving, my mind wanders, and, but once it enters my thoughts, I have control on whether or not I want to, um, to keep that thought or, you right. know, or think about something else. Exactly. So, what Malka is saying is very true. So let me tell you a story. <clears throat> there was once a chassid. He was a chassid of the Magad of Mizrich. And he came to the rabbi and he asked the rabbi, <clears throat> he told the rabbi, rabbi, what do I do? I'm having a hard time controlling my thoughts. I don't know what to do. I really, I'm really, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring it all out. So the Rebbe told him, I don't know if I can help you. However, there is a chassid that lives on the outskirts of town. And his name, <clears throat> his name is Reblaib, and he can help you. So he goes and he travels to Reblaib. Reblaib lived at the end of the forest, a good distance, a few hours walk away. And he comes in to the forest. He's traveling. It's bitter, cold, snowing. And finally, he sees a light in the window of Reblaib's house. And it's very, very, very early in the morning. It's around dawn. And he knocks on the door. He knocks on the door. And he can see through the creek, through the crack in the door, through the hole, the Reblaib is just in the other room and he's sitting and he's studying. So he figures Reblaib doesn't hear me. So I'm going to knock a little bit hard. He knocks, he knocks, and he's banging and he's pounding. And by now, he's already very, very cold. He's bitter cold. And he doesn't know what to do. Reblaib is not answering. Anyway, <clears throat> he, he can't take the frost anymore, so he leaves. He goes to the nearest shul, the nearest synagogue, to rest his weary bones, to warm himself up a little bit by the fire. <clears throat> sure enough, he goes to the shul, and it's right before Shabbos. And all of a sudden, he sees, as the people are starting to get ready to pray the Shabbos prayer, he sees Reblaib coming to the shul. He runs over to Reblaib and he says, Reblaib, Reblaib. He says, I was at your house today. I was knocking on the door. He didn't answer. He says, come, come to my house. He brings his stuff to the house. He gives him a comfortable bed. He makes Kiddush for Shabbos. He takes care of him in a five-star way. As much as he was able to, he gives him the best bed. He gives him food. He treats him so beautifully. He tells him stories and songs. Same thing happens the next day on Shabbat. Finally, after Shabbat is over, he thanks Reb Leib for the wonderful hospitality. He thanks him for being such a good host. But he tells them the truth is, Reb Leib, that the Magid sent me here because I asked him a question. The question that I asked him was, how does a person control the thoughts that come into his head? And the Maga told me he doesn't have an answer, but I should go to Reblaib. So Reblaib looks at him with a kind of smile. And he said, I thought that I already answered you this question when you first came to town. So he thinks for a moment and he's trying to think. 
I, I, I don't remember asking you. I don't remember getting the answer. He says, remember when you came to my house on Friday morning and you knocked on the door. Remember, so he starts to think, yeah, of course, I was banging on the door, you didn't answer. He says, I was, I was answering the question. Just because there's a knock at the door, it doesn't mean you have to answer the door. It doesn't mean you have to let the person in. Just because there's a knock at your door, it doesn't mean you have to invite the person in for a coffee, right? With thought, it's the same process. Throughout the day, we have hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of thoughts that race through our mind constantly on a regular basis. They could be good thoughts, they could be bad thoughts. They could be thoughts that are encumbering us. They could be thoughts that are, 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 are things that we wanna think about, right? There's always thoughts that are going through our minds. The thoughts that go through our minds, like Malka said so beautifully, we don't have control of. We don't have control over what goes into our mind, what goes into our head. But we do have control whether when we hear the knock at the door, when something comes into our mind and we notice the thought, we think the thought, we feel the thought, it's up to us if we want to invite the thought in and have tea and coffee and really allow ourselves to, let's say we have a negative thought, not a positive thought, something that we don't want to think about. We have the choice if we're going to let that thought come to our mind and then push ourselves to think about something else. Or if we're gonna sit down, we're gonna really meditate on this thought, we're gonna fantasize about this negative behavior, whatever it is, and we're gonna start to fantasize about it. That fantasy that we take into our minds, that's in our control. And this is what Alter Rebbe is telling us. Of course, thought is harder than speech and action, no question. But there's no question that thought is 100% in our control. If we decide we want to think about something and meditate about it and fantasize about it, that is all up to us. And ultimately, we have control over our thoughts, speech, and action. It's called the garments of the soul because we can take them on and put them on at will. So here is about the Rebbe is getting at, slowly but surely. What the Rebbe is telling us, we all have two souls. Our soul, that's our godly soul, has the full gamut of personality. It has all the 10 building blocks. Not only does it have the 10 building blocks, it also has the, the three garments of the soul. The expressions, the way that the soul expresses itself are also present in the godly soul. Not only that, the food for the soul, which we're gonna talk about next week, in chapter five, is also part of the soul's experience. Not only that, the animal soul also has the 10 building blocks and it has the three garments of the soul. So there are two complete processing systems within a human being. There's the godly soul, which processes things in a godly way. And there is the animal soul, which processes things in an animalistic way, in a selfish way, in a material, in a human way. Both of these souls are on display every moment of the day. And they are both fighting for control of the body. They're fighting for control of the human experience, the human being. The way that is going to express itself is controlled by one of the two operating systems at all times. Now, what the Rebbe is going to tell us this. You can understand now what the difference between a Rasha, a Tzaddik, and a Bainan is. Who I am is my insides. What I do is my outsides. Right? It's the way I express myself to myself and to others. Who I am, I have no control over for the most part. What I do, I have full control over for the most part. A tzaddik is somebody who God created him with a perfect inside. 
his insides, that means what his impulses are, what his cravings are, the battle that's going on inside of him. In other words, you can take whatever you want. The battle that's going on inside of him. In other words, he doesn't have that battle. But his cravings, his desires, his proclivities to do things, his yearnings, his needs, his all the things that are happening inside of me, for a tzaddik, those are all holy. His cravings are holy cravings. He's craving to be closer to God. His his needs, his impulses are godly impulses. All of his insights are godly. They are holy. They're one with God. And naturally, because his insights are holy, his outsides, the way he expresses himself, his thought is going to be holy thoughts. His speech is going to be holy speech. His actions are going to be holy actions. A tzaddik is complete in his holiness on the inside and on the outside. We don't have very many examples of a tzaddik in our generation. In the physical world, there are not many people that their insides and their outsides match in such a dominant way. There is one person that I can think of in our generation, the Rebbe. The Rebbe passed away in 1994, but for 40 years, his actions, almost 24 hours a day, were being monitored by other people, either by Chassidim, by the people that helped him in his home, which he had people in his home to, the entire day. He never had a private moment. The only time the Rebbe had a private moment was when he was sitting with his wife for 30 minutes a day when he would eat every single day a meal with his wife and he would go to sleep at night for a couple hours a night. There was no other time that the Rebbe was not being monitored by other people and yet the Rebbe never uttered something that was not godly. The Rebbe never did something that was not godly. The Rebbe never thought something that was not godly. The Rebbe's whole life was an expression of godliness. His inside and his outside were on a tzaddik level. That's a tzaddik. Now, the Rebbe called this book Sefer Shel Bainanin, a Sefer of a Bainanin. And what he's telling us is that our job in life is not to be a tzaddik. We have no business even trying to expect ourselves to be a tzaddik. We're not a tzaddik. A tzaddik are special human beings that God planted in every generation. One of them, or two of them in every generation, that they are the souls that help the Jewish people connect to God. They give the Jewish people emuna and das. They give them that their faith in God should be real. Right? This is a Reb. A Reb is Reish Bnei Yisrael. He's a head. But then there's, and then there's a Russia, the opposite extreme. A Russia is somebody who has his insides are ugly. His, he has skeletons in his closet. He has negative impulses. He has proclivities for things that he would never want to tell anybody. He has thoughts. He, he has, I mean, uh, he has his, his needs, his inside desires are, are negative, are not good. They're not positive. They're not the way God wants them to be. That's a Russia. But the Russia also takes these insides and he expresses them on the outside. So he thinks about things that he shouldn't. He speaks about things, lush and hara, God forbid, about other people. He speaks foul language. He speaks things that are not good things. He acts. His actions are not good also. His actions are things that are not in line with the way God wants them to be. His actions and his insights, his insights and his outsides are also very aligned. They're both not aligned with God. And then there's the Bainan. A Bainan is somebody who he looks like a Rasha on the inside, but he looks like a Tzaddik on the outside. How is that possible? Because on the inside, he has a fiery battle going on. He has terrible impulses. He has impulses that are, are not those that he should have. Actually, they are those that he should have because they're the ones that God wanted him to have. But his impulses are selfish. His impulses are negative. His impulses are, are not good. His, all of his cravings and his skeletons and his causes, things that he would never talk to anybody about. Only he himself knows about them. A Bainini on the inside looks just like a Rasha on the inside. If you would open up and you would scan his inside, you would see all sorts of negative behavior. Impulses for that. 
He wants things. He craves things. He has impulses for things. He has skeletons in his closet. All of those things, there's a battle waging inside of him. And it's fiery. However, he never allows any of these impulses on his inside to be expressed in thought, speech, and action. He has full control over his thought. He has full control over his speech. And he has full control over his actions. And this is something that the Rebbe is telling us that we have within our power to reach this level. To reach a level where we connect to God on a level of thought, speech, and action. In other words, even though we have a battle going on inside of our heart, we can always choose to do the right thing, the godly thing. We can always choose to speak the right things, the godly way. And we can always choose to think godly thoughts. And maybe it's impossible for a person to live like this all of his life, but it's certainly possible to have vain any moments, to have vain any moments. And as we go through life, we'll see that when we do, for this, a human being was created. God wants the person to struggle. God created the person with struggle. That is the way God wanted us to be. He wanted us to struggle in our insides. But God gets the greatest joy, happiness, fulfillment. God created all of mankind so that a person could push away one bad thought, so that a person could push away one bad speech, so that a person should push away one bad action and align himself, his expressions of his soul his thought speech and action with god for this a human being was created that's chapter four not only that in chapter four he takes it a step further and he says that in some ways the expressions of the soul the garments of the soul they're more in tune with the godly essence that a person has. In other words, they're higher even, they come from a higher source even than the soul itself. So that's chapter four, my dear friends. Next week, we're going to talk about the food of the soul, which is Torah. And I'm going to explain to you why it's called the food of the soul. Following that, in chapter six and seven, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the animal soul. And then we're going to continue with, we're going to bring it together in chapter nine to tell us what is the, Raison d'être. What is the purpose of all of this? <clears throat> Any questions before I sign off? My dear friends, have a very good day. Remember that today is Lagba Omer. It's a special day to ask for all sorts of blessings. All blessings. It's a very, very special and very powerful spiritual day. Have a great day. God bless you. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye.